Okay, our next speaker is Anne Sizemore Blevins. All right, well, thank you so much uh, to both uh, Heather and Mason. This has been a lot of fun today. <laughs> and I sort of connect with community when I uh, can't see you all in person. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, uh, as Mason said, I'm Anne Sizemore Blevins. I'm excited to talk to you today about uh, my most recent project, uh, the reorderability of growing grass. This is a project that was inspired by um, recent work um, or a recent observation in growing semantic networks. And if I don't explain <laughs> what that observation was by the end of it, please let me know. Um, but uh, mostly this is sort of a, a fun uh, puzzle sort of talk. Um, all right, so let's get started. So the basic idea uh, we'll be talking about uh, for today is uh, growing graphs and, and the process of growing graphs. So we'll have, we'll start with the simplest case of growing a graph where we're adding nodes one by one and we'll add edges between nodes, uh, if, between the, the new node added and any previous nodes. Those are the only edges that we're allowed to add until finally we've grown our completed graph right here. So we have a graph that we've grown on six nodes um, and they're labeled A, B, C through F. Now we can grow a different type of graph, again on six nodes. Uh, but here, uh, our final graph looks very different, right? So here I've grown two different types of graphs, each on six nodes, fine. So the big question we'll, we'll start to look at is what happens when the ordering of the nodes changes? So many biological systems are noisy and often you might have for example, node C be born before node B. Well, how does that affect uh, the topology of the graph being grown? So let's take, for example, what happens if we switch nodes B and D? Well, on the left side, our first growing graph, seems like nothing really changes. If I look after each node addition, uh, the graph is similar. I don't know if you guys can see me doing my hand wavies, but <laughs> similar uh, to the originally grown graph. Similar for, similarly for graph two, uh, we also have that if we swap nodes B and D, basically nothing really changes in the growing topology, still being hand wavy about it, uh, of this growing graph. So did we just get lucky? Uh, if we always swap a pair of nodes that are only uh, you know, two apart, will we always have such good luck? Let's swap instead nodes D and F from the original growing graph and see what happens. In the first case, we actually find that the swap of nodes D and F uh, creates very, a, a very different growing process. So with the addition of the fourth node, here is F, we now have uh, a loop of four nodes that's tessellated by triangles instead of this large open cavity that we usually expect at after the addition of the fourth node. Similarly, after the addition of the fifth node, we have one large open cavity and some triangles instead of two large open cavities, so on. So this FD swap has actually changed the, the growing process in this way, or the, the topologies that the graph sees as it grows. However, for graph two, the growing graph two, uh, we do not see any change with the swap in D and F. So our fundamental question is going to be what sorts of graphs can we swap uh, nodes within their growing process and uh, not change the topology or change the pop to topology? And what does that tell us um, really about, about these graph models? So, um, for example, this could be important for applications such as seizures. If you imagine a seizure spreading throughout uh, the brain network, uh, perhaps the, uh, the ordering on the nodes and the topology that that ordering induces uh, affects the uh, seizure, seizure severity. So before we get <laughs> too far ahead of ourselves, we have some fun toy examples, but let's talk a little bit more in depth about what does it mean to be reorderable. I think I might have accidentally said that word before defining it, so <laughs> let's talk about that now. So when we're growing a, a graph, and all you've seen so far are binary graphs, um, all that really matters is the, the binary graph that you have and then the ordering on the nodes. So I'm always going to be growing the same binary graph, so I don't, really don't need to care about it right now, um, but we need to focus on the ordering of the nodes. So let's say that this is our original ordering, uh, red to purple. So there are two types of uh, 
ways in which you can imagine trying to understand the rotability. Um, the first being is the top so this is our this is now in a box because it's our standard original ordering. Uh, so we could imagine asking if the topology of the growing process is resilient to large changes in the node order, such as randomly shuffling all the nodes. So now I have a very different uh, node order. Um, and if the growing topology has not changed, then we'll say that that growing graph has or exhibits global reorderability. On the other hand, we could do something more like what we saw at the beginning of the presentation, uh, where we just swap two nodes. So here we'll swap the gold and the light blue nodes and see if the uh, growing topology changes. So if the graph then, uh, the growing graph is resilient to those, uh, the topology of the growing graph is resilient to those sorts of changes, we'll say that it exhibits uh, local reorderability. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit more formally about how we grow a graph. Uh, so a growing graph we'll define as a pair, B comma S, uh, in which B is a binary graph. Uh, it will be, and our actual results will be on 70 nodes, but here are examples on six nodes. And then S is an ordering on the nodes, just telling us how uh, we add nodes, and, like what the order is that we grow the graph. Uh, and every time we add a new node, it will basically be a subset or, or subgraph um, of the entire uh, graph B, uh, just defined by the nodes that have already been added. Now this ordering can come from a weighting function, uh, for example, uh, gene expression, brain activity, a month at which a, a word is learned by, <laughs> uh, by children, it says node weighted graphs. Um, but what we really want to do is take this pair B comma S, however we get it, and then create this growing graph where again we're adding nodes one at a time and we're adding, adding edges between the new node and any uh, previously added nodes if that edge exists in the binary graph. Okay, so uh, we're not going to talk just about little graphs I can draw. We'll talk about real models and ask if they have these reorderability properties. So you'll see six models down below. We'll only focus mostly on these two, the constant probability and proportional probability models. So these models um, uh, sort of have a very similar definition. So for the constant probability at each uh, new node addition, we will add an edge between uh, the new node being added and all previous nodes uh, with probability 0.4. So regardless if you're the third node added or the 70th, you'll always connect to the previously added nodes with probability 0.4. Now, on the other hand, in the proportional probability model, we'll grow a graph uh, where uh, if we're adding the ith node, then the probability of connecting to all previous nodes uh, will be i over big N, where N is the total number of nodes. So here again is 70. So importantly for the proportional probability model, the last nodes added within the graph uh, will likely connect to almost every single other node in the network. Now, uh, if you wanna learn more about some of these others, um, I can refer you to the paper, but we also looked at embedded models, socially embedded models, the common preferential attachment model, and this fun oscillating probability model where this uh, pro uh, probability just oscillates throughout the uh, growth process. So in order to uh, really get down into the details about comparing graphs, we're really uh, going to look at the topology or the uh, emerging topology, the persistent homology of these growing graphs. So to do that, we need to translate over to the language of algebraic topology, in which we use simplices as our building blocks, uh, just like we use nodes and edges. Uh, and luckily, Lori uh, went through many of these concepts already, already so thank you, Lori. <laughs> I can whip through this a little bit. Um, so uh, what we'll do is we'll take our graph, our binary graph, and uh, we'll just color in all completely connected subgraphs or all cliques. Um, with simplices. So I'm just attaching simplices wherever I can, and this is called a simplicial complex. So graph colored into the simplicial complex, also known as the clique complex. Um, so then when we com combine uh, this uh, construction with our growing graph process, we get a growing simplicial complex from the growing graph. So we have growing graph and the growing simplicial complex, which I've called the node filtered order complex or an order complex for short. Um, this is very similar to the weight rate clique filtration or the uh, order complex, but um, I've added node filtered to uh, distinguish it uh, 
from the edge filtered case. And then just like uh, anytime we have a filtration of uh, synthetical, uh, uh, synthetical complexes, we can run persistent homology. Uh, so this will be persistent homology for the growing graph case. So the persistent homology is going to track uh, the emerging cavities uh, throughout the graph, the graph growth process. <laughs> there are a lot of tongue teasers in this presentation. Um, so we'll, we'll see, one of the outputs is called a barcode. Um, we'll, we'll have our nodes, the number of nodes that we've added along the bottom. Uh, and then uh, we'll be one bar for each persistent cavity and a bar begins at the, the uh, first time we see that cavity merge. It lives on uh, and then the cavity is finally tessellated, which is marked by the end of the bar. So we can compute the persistent homology uh, for multiple dimensions. For computational regions, we'll focus on dimensions one through three. Uh, and some example cavities shown on the left. And here uh, we have an example barcode. Uh, we'll, we'll highlight uh, or distinguish um, bars by their color to denote their dimension. And we can also summarize uh, by their Betty curves, uh, which counts the number of persistent cavities alive uh, at any uh, point in this growing graph process which again is going to be marked by the number of nodes we've added so far. So together the barcode and, and the Betty curve, which is a nice summary, uh, describes the, the growing topology of uh, this growing graph. Okay, so we talked about how to do this for one growing graph, um, but remember we want to understand how this works in uh, model networks for star stochastics, so we need to uh, repeat this many times over many replicates. So our basic workflow is uh, to create a growing graph using one of the models that we talked about, and then run persistent homology, and then we'll average the Betty curves over all of our replicates. Uh, so again, let's say we take the constant probability model, we'll use that to generate a B, which is a binary graph here, and an S, the ordering on the nodes, which is always just going to be just standard one, two, three, four, five, just the order in which we've added them. Um, and we'll, we'll do this 100 times and then compute the persistent homology, average over the replicates. And the next slide, you'll also see these plots, which are uh, an example uh, adjacency, well, half adjacency matrix for one example grown graph, its arc diagram, and its barcode. All right. So uh, this slide is just to show that we can achieve a range of different persistent homology signatures from these grand graphs, which is a lot of fun. I've uh, spent a lot of time looking at edge filtered cases, but uh, the node filtered cases is just as fun. <laughs> just because it's oscillating probability mile down here where we get this uh, multiple peaks by the curves. Uh, but again, let's, we're going to focus mostly for the rest of the talk on the proportional and the constant probability model, uh, which in the regular case when we grow them appropriately, I have these sorts of signatures. Okay, so let's get down into the reorderability uh, and actually testing this. So what we'll do first is uh, sort of just a basic test. We'll take our generated growing graphs um, and just the original generated growing graphs and we'll average their Betty curves in the solid line just like we did on the last slide. And then for each of these, uh, graphs, we will generate 100 reorderings. So we're going to keep the, for each of these guys, I'm going to keep the uh, binary graph be the same, but then randomly reorder the nodes. So if this uh, node order is V0, V1, V2, V3, uh, this graph, the same B, will be grown in the order of V2, then V4, V3, V0, and so on. So we'll compute 100 reorderings for each of these generated grand graphs. Uh, compute the persistent homology, average those Betty curves, and then record this as a dashed line. So if the dashed line and the solid line match very well, then uh, this is a good indication that this is a reorderable graph. And if they do not, do, not, do not match, then you've messed up the topology a lot by reordering the nodes. So perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, we see that the constant probability uh, model uh, has uh, shows Betty curves that are very close to the Betty curves from all of the reorderings. Uh, again, not surprising because we're basically growing an error rating graph. Um, however, the proportional probabil probability model down here, so here again, the solid lines are the originally generated um, Betty curves from the originally generated graph. 
and I did not forget, forget to plot the dashed lines. They're just all down here at zero. This is because, remember, for this model, these final nodes added, uh, well, the nodes added uh, at the very end, the original ordering, uh, are likely connected to almost every single other node in the graph. So when I reorder the nodes, those highly connected, high degree nodes get pushed first, they get pushed earlier on at least, um, preventing homology from forming throughout the rest of the growth process. Okay, but let's get a little bit more quantitative about this. This is all certainly uh, by eye. So what we need to do is to find some distances. Now we'll take, we'll define two different distances. We'll, we'll use two different distances to help us uh, quantify um, really how far apart the original graphs are, or the persistent homology of the original graphs are from their persistent homology of their reorderings. Um, and for that, we'll use both a, a, the bottleneck distance as a distance between barcodes. Uh, so bottleneck distance just matches two barcodes, let's say the, the solid and the dashed ones, and then we'll measure the furthest that any bar had to move either in the left or the right direction um, to meet its matched pair. Uh, and then we'll also use this Betty curve distance, um, which if you overlay the two Betty curves together, um, I'm just going to find um, the x value at which they are farthest apart uh, and take that vertical distance as the Betty curve distance. So nothing too complicated. We just wanted to find uh, a distance, or wanted to use a distance between the barcodes and a distance between the Betty curves uh, that are uh, similar in nature. Okay, so now <laughs> let's uh, uh, use these distances to get a little more quantitative about our reorderability. Um, so what we need to do first is understand really sort of the, the scope of possible um, persistent homology outputs which we could get from just their originally generated brain graphs. So up here I have this imaginary persistent homology output space. Uh, this is for conceptual use only. <laughs> um, but basically the idea is that first we want to take um, many pairs, uh, I think all pairs of growing gener originally generated growing graphs um, from one model. And I'm going to look at the distance between their uh, persistent homology outputs, so either the barcode or the, the Betty distance, um, and then uh, record this, that distribution of distances in this dark box plot. So this is asking um, whether or not for our model, we're, we're producing a lot of persistent homology that's a lot, that's very close together, or if the persistent homology can vary uh, quite widely uh, just by, you know, generating a new growing graph from the same, same rules. And then we can compare this to uh, the distance between the generated, the originally generated grinning graphs and each of their reorderings. So here, I'm going to take the distance between uh, my grown graph and each of its uh, 100 reorderings. So I'll get uh, 100 distances from this column, 100 distances from this column, and so on, and look at the distribution of those distances. So here, again, our little conceptual map, uh, if this box plot is equal or much lower than the dark box plot. Uh, this indicates that the, uh, if we reorder the graph, uh, if we have, we have a growing graph and we reorder this growing graph, um, we'll actually get a persistent homology signature that's much closer to the original than to just you know, spawning up a whole new growing graph. So we might have points that look like this in our, again, imaginary space. This is a system we would say that is very reorderable. And in contrast, uh, if this box is much higher than the light box is much higher than the dark box, then this indicates that our um, our reordered uh, graphs have persistent homology that is uh, even more different from the originally generated growing graphs than the originally uh, generated growing graphs are from each other. All right, so reorderable, not reorderable, <laughs> and these are the sort of signatures we'll look for in the next slide. Um, and indeed, we confirmed that uh, the constant probability model, even um, with our sort of uh, more quantitative approach, is very reorderable, um, whereas the proportional probability definitely is not. Uh, we're seeing that uh, the, um, the reordered uh, graphs are much farther away from the originally generated graphs um, than the graphs are from each other. So that suggests that our little space looks something like this. Uh, where uh, basically we could pluck any pair of uh, originally generated or uh, reordered constant probability graphs and 
they might as well be the same, but the proportional probability generates uh, model generates growing graphs that have very interesting persistent homology, but then when we reorder them, all the persistent homology is basically killed. So all of their little reorderings are down here. Okay, we can then uh, look at the space of graphs based on uh, these sort of uh, reorderings. Uh, or these types of reorderings, um, either or, uh, reorderability, either based on the barcode distances or the Betty curve distances. And we can make graphs that occupy any four of these quadrants. So very quickly, I'll go through our local reorderability. Um, so this is uh, much closer to what we talked about at the beginning of the presentation. So we can grow a graph, uh, the original growing graph, which will be denoted by S sub zero for the original ordering. It gives us a barcode. Now we can swap, let's say nodes one and five, that gives us a new growing graph, uh, B uh, comma S sub one comma five, and that will give us a new barcode. Now we can use the uh, bottleneck distance to compute the distance between those, and then repeat this process for every pair of nodes uh, within the growing network, which gives us a matrix where the ijth entry is a bottleneck distance between the originally grown graph and the growing graph where we've swapped nodes I and J. Now, those of you familiar with the stability theorem will know that there is a maximal, or there is an upper bound on the bottleneck distance here given by the difference between nodes I and J. So we're gonna define a metric called the topological similarity of a pair of nodes um, by one minus the bottleneck distance over I minus J. So that if a node pair is, has a topological similarity of one, uh, they, the swap has not changed the barcode at all. Whereas if the topological sim similarity of a pair of nodes is zero, they have changed the, uh, uh, the barcode maximally. So we can repeat this, or run this process for both of our models. Uh, the constant probability uh, topological similarity matrix uh, is very uh, homogeneous. Um, in a way, it has a very similar pattern throughout most of the growth process, where the proportional probability has this uh, dense area where um, all of these ending nodes can be swapped with each other. Um, because again, they're, they're connect connecting to everybody, so not messing up too much. And uh, you can run network analysis on these topological similarity <laughs> graphs and learn even more about your function or about your graph. So uh, finally, um, one last point before I end is uh, to quickly talk about how these concepts relate. Um, and the idea being that if we take a growing graph, we can create a topological similarity graph by defining edges between nodes if their uh, swap does not change the barcode at all. Um, and one thing we know that is if we have a total re totally reorderable growing graph, then T will be completely connected. But the question becomes, if T, this graph is completely connected, does this mean this growing graph is totally reorderable? That means all node swaps get the same barcode. Uh, we can reduce this question to asking if we find a clique in T, will any reordering of those nodes give the same persistent homology? And as you can imagine, I have left it till the last minute uh, because the answer is very boring no. And here's a nice counterexample uh, for you to, to show that that is the case. So in fact, the answer is no, but I, I think the topological similarity graph or simplicial complex as noted by Jacob Hansen can still perhaps offer some, some uh, interesting information about the growing graph. So with that, I'll just conclude. We talked today about uh, ideas, uh, global reorderability, local reorderability, and uh, how these two concepts might relate. So thank you uh, to uh, my PI, uh, Danny Bassett, and to all of the students in her lab and in Rob's lab uh, for your help over the years. And I'm excited for any questions. Thank you very much. Um, so if anybody has questions, please ping either Heather or me and we will call on you. Um, so I don't see any yet. Heather, do you have any on your end? Not yet. Okay, so I will ask a, a quick question to start us off. Um, of course, you, you, you mentioned various um, you know, heavily studied models in growing networks. Um, and um, that have been studied from various perspectives. So is, is there a quick way to summarize the insights you get onto these models as a, as a way to contrast it from insights that people have gotten on those models from studying them different ways? 
Oh, interesting. Yeah, so I, I suppose uh, what this really tells you is uh, about what happened, what would happen if uh, we messed up that model. So oftentimes, uh, for example, the preferential attachment is used to model some actual system. Um, well, what happens if that, the growth of that system is messed up? Uh, and that's, uh, yeah, in, in brief, what this reorderability would tell you. So the preferential attachment, I believe, was you know, somewhat reorderable. Um, so you would, yeah, uh, the topology of that growing process really wouldn't change too much. Okay, thank you. Uh, I do have a question that came up in my feed. Uh, this is from Daniel Adamich, and he doesn't have audio, so I'm going to ask for him. Uh, so he's, he asked, did I miss the promise connection to semantic networks? <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, no, I just uh, ran through it too fast. But in semantic networks, uh, uh, what we observed was that uh, there's uh, an expected order in which uh, children will learn words um, in their early early ages, or an average order, I suppose. Um, and then we we noticed that if you actually uh, randomly reorder those notes, um, the growing uh, the persistent homology of that growing network of the semantic uh, word network uh, is very similar. And I thought that was just very unexpected <laughs> that the uh, semantic network would have that property. And so we started investigating if, if that really was expected, if all graph models have that property, or if that was something special. Okay, we have one quick question on my end from Corey Brown. So if you can unmute yourself um, and, and go ahead. Hey. hey. Um, I actually have a, a quick one related to a, a short conversation I had with Mason when I ran into him at Pete's Coffee near UCLA. Yeah, okay. uh, the others don't know the conversation, so just give give. Yeah, give. I know. I, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, as I mentioned, question or comment in the previous talk, I'm interested in time varying network analysis or um, description of uh, uh, the dynamics of mathematical structure of any sort, really, but. Um, obviously here topological. Uh, and what I, uh, idea I have with these Betty curves um, related to some uh, uh, network theory analysis um, is the idea of using this data-driven dynamical systems concepts on these Betty curves, especially the ones you have look nice and smooth as you increase your node count. Uh, so if you think of that as your time, mm -hmm. um, you have nice, nice uh, signals that I think data-driven dynamical systems uh, would uh, be able to extract information from. The difficult part is understanding what is that underlying dynamical system which you are characterizing. Uh, but I have some ideas around this and I'm currently writing a, an independent paper on. Um, but maybe even Mason might have um, comments on this idea. I'm curious what you think, uh, Anne, also. <laughs> yeah, that sounds very fun. Um, I definitely think uh, there's there's some overlap there depending on how you def uh, kind of define how nodes are added to this graph. Um, but uh, also I want to point out a, a reminder that those, uh, everything looks so smooth because they're averaged over hundreds of replicates. It's not just, uh, <laughs> not right. just one growing graph. Um, yeah, I've, I've worked with um, uh, molecular dynamics data in which we have observables which are fairly uh, rough, just like these Betty curves are for single trajectories. Um, but when we average, we get smooth stuff. Mm -hmm. And on individual trajectories, we still get analysis that looks like what's done on the smooth analysis. So um, these methods, uh, in certain cases, seem to be fairly robust to those sort of okay. roughness. So, so this, this is getting a bit into the weeds that I think is, should be pursued in an offline conversation. Sure. Also running a bit over. So I'll, <laughs> let, I'll let you two hook up with each other and chat um, offline yes. oh. other Zoom window or something. Um, so let, me, let me start. So let's thank Anne again, first of all. Yeah, wonderful talk. Um, let me. And, and also, like a, a default to that, those of you, there was a few, I think, in my 